Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of General Conference Conversations, the podcast where we have conversations about General Conference. I'm your host, Kaylin, and today we are talking about Elder Esplin's talk, The Savior's Healing Power Upon Isles of the Sea, which is a bit of a long, uh, toddle, but it's all good. Um... <laughs> As always, I encourage you to read or watch or listen to um, this talk before you come and listen to me talk about it so you can get your own inspirations and things that stand out to you specifically, personally. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to have a whole lot to add to this talk. It's kind of one big story, so I'm going to try and... um, just retell the story and, and... relate it to my life, my experiences a little bit, and some other things that kind of come up, came up as I was reading. But it's really just a story, so uh, I'm really not sure how much I can converse with this, other than to kind of retell it and, and add some add some anecdotes of my own. So he tells the story of, well, so he's kind of telling the story of his name. Um, I'm not sure what his first name is, but his middle name is Kimo, right? J. Kimo Esplin. And his, when he was born, his dad was teaching at the Church College of Hawaii in Laie, in Hawaii. And when he was born, his seven older sisters insisted that they name him Kimo. And so at the time they were living so he kind of goes in from that into telling the story of specifically the Laie Hawaii temple and um like how it served the entire Asia Pacific area right so um this in the 60s and he he tells the story of one specific um sister from Okinawa um she was married in a traditional arranged Buddhist wedding, and just a few months after she was married, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, um, and that started kind of started the the Pacific theater of World War II, kind of pulling the United States in, right, and, and pulling in that that kind of different war front over there, and. They got pushed back towards Japan, and they kind of island hopped for a while and got back to Japan. And and for three months in 1945, the Battle of Okinawa happened. And there were a bunch of warships, and they were just bombarding the island. And this woman and her husband and their two children lived in a cave for six months. And, which just sounds off, absolutely terrible, and somehow they were able to endure the six months through just pure force of will, right? <laughs> like, absolutely insane. And so the, the battle ended, the war ended, and she started to seek answers about God. Um, and she slowly learned about Christ and wanted to be baptized. And something that was kind of missing in in the Christian teaching she was finding was she was concerned about her her loved ones who had died before knowing Christ, before being converted to Christianity. And so, of course, meeting the missionaries, right, from the church, um, big deal. Learning that Christ and the spirit world and her... Um, being taught in the spirit world and having the opportunity, right, to to partake of these ordinances even after death. And so she and her family were baptized. And they had three more kids, they were faithful, and then her husband um, unexpectedly died of a stroke. And so she had to work multiple jobs to provide for all five of her kids. And a lot of people in her family and in her community thought that it like this was the result of joining Christianity. Basically, that it was kind of the um, 
the consequence of, of converting Christianity, all these terrible things were happening to her. And, but she continued to stay strong and, and press forward. And a few years after her husband's death, the mission president of Japan encouraged Japanese members to work towards going to the temple, which was, of course, the closest at the time was Laie. Which is about, they said a little bit later, it was about 10,000 10, miles from Japan. And this was very, very hard. Um, obviously, financially, logistically, you know, being able to get there, take work off, pay for it, right? And um, as kind of another thing on that list, was the Japanese um, mission president, the mission president of Japan. He was an American, and he was a battle of Okinawa, a, a veteran of the Battle of Okinawa. Um, but this sister was like, he was an, aid, an enemy, but now he was here with the gospel, and like he had brought the gospel, he was helping to bring the gospel to Japan. So I'll come in a little bit later as well. All right, so she wanted to really really wanted to be sealed her family in the, in the temple um and over the years there's a couple things that kind of solutions emerged right they were gonna charter an entire plane to fly to hawaii in the off season they recorded final records entitled japanese saints sing and sold them they sold their houses, they quit their jobs, like they just made unbelievable sacrifices to get to the temple. Um, and then they were able to find a Japanese brother to travel to Hawaii and translate the endowment ceremony into Japanese. And it was amazing for Japanese members who were living in Hawaii who were able to hear it in their native language for the first time. It was just blew them away. So they, they took the, what was it this year? I'm trying to think, I'm trying to find what year it was. Anyway, I can't think, I can't find the actual year. Um, but they first, they'd made the first trip. They chartered a, a plane and 161 adults and children went from Tokyo to Hawaii and visited the temple. And um, they said one brother, one Japanese brother was like, man, I was looking, you know, looking out the window and seeing Pearl Harbor and remembering what our country had done and thinking, you know, what are they going to accept us? Are they going to show us kindness? And they did. They showed greater love and kindness than he'd ever seen in his life. They um, brought them flower lace and gave hugs and kisses. And they spent 10 days there, and then that kind of continued to go. So this the second trip, this this widow that he's talking about from Okinawa made her the trip herself and was sealed to her husband, did her mother's work. Um, and those temple trips, they continued regularly until uh, 1980. There's a temple dedicated in Tokyo. And just November of last year, so uh, just a few months ago, they had a temple de dedicated in Okinawa, Japan. And anyway, so this is whole thing, right, is of course um, the bringing together of God's children through temple work, through the gospel. He talks about um, he served in Japan uh, as a young missionary and his dad was a veteran of, was a World War II veteran who, who served in the military in the Pacific um, and was thrilled that his son was going to be there spreading the gospel. And I just think about like, I don't know, the like, the emotional whiplash that must be for some people, right? I mean, and I, I don't claim to have any sort of feeling of what that's what that feels like or anything right but like to think about that just to think about like 
And I also know during World War II, like when it started, there were missionaries serving in Germany who were then sent back as soldiers who were fighting the very people that they were trying to convert to the gospel and trying to help. Right? It was just terrible. Um, but like on the, on that flip side of being of having you or your son be sent to the very place where you were fighting with these people to bring them peace and love um is a beautiful parallel it's a beautiful like a craziness of the world right um and the end of his talk he says this through temple blessings the savior heals individuals families and nations even those that once stood as bitter enemies the resurrected Lord declared to a conflict-ridden society in the Book of Mormon that unto those who honor my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. I was reminded um, somebody in our ward gave a talk uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, referencing Elder Renlund's talk from back in October of 2021, where he shares kind of a similar story to this, not similar, but in kind of the same vein, right? He uh, is Finnish, his father's Finnish, and um, he attended the dedication of the Helsinki Finland Temple in 2006. Uh, his father and his grandparents were early converts to the church in Finland and they had dreamed of a temple for a long, long time, right? And so the temple district uh, would encompass, at the time, would encompass Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, and Russia. And when he got there, he learned that the first day of general operation of the temple was going to be set aside just for Russian members to perform the temple ordinances. And he says it was really difficult to explain just how amazing this was. Russia and Finland were bitter enemies. Um, they fought a lot of wars. His father even disliked not only Russia, but all Russians. He told them that repeatedly over his like his life. And it was it's very typical of Finnish kind of anger and distrust of Russia. Um, he soon says that he had memorized epic poems that chronicled 19th century warfare between Finns and Russians, and there's crazy, right? But a year before they dedicated the Helsinki temple in Finland, um, the temple committee was mostly um, consisted of Finnish members. They met to discuss the plans for the dedication, the open house, and everything. And during that meeting, someone mentioned you know the russian saints are going to be traveling days and days to attend the dedication and they might want to do their their you know to attend the temple as well after the open house and after the dedication and so they one of the the, the chairman he suggested that the Finns could wait a little bit longer and they would set aside the first day just for the Rus russian saints to do their temple work and the entire committee agreed and the area presidency at the time he said he was never been prouder of the Finns for you know putting aside their history with this with the Russians and like and and letting the gospel and letting the excitement about the temple and sharing that with Russia um, take center stage and letting them have that first day was a great sign of kind of forgiveness and sacrifice. And he told, he said when he told his dad, he came back, he told his dad about this, uh, he cried. And until from then, until he died, three years later, he never said anything negative again about Russia. He was inspired by those members um, and decided to put the resentment he had for Russia to the side in 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 lieu of of uh, um, if, to have his like discipleship in the gospel in in place of that and so anyway that just that that line right of 
Elder Esplin, through the temple, the Savior heals individuals, families, and nations. Um, it really is miraculous, right? The, the crazy, amazing things that are going on in the world. Um, and so that's my question, is how have you seen this healing in your life? It may not be to this scale, right? Maybe you do have a crazy big story like this about generations long <laughs> um, fights or whatever going on in, in families or countries being um, healed and, and, and um, brought together by the power of Christ. But even just in your personal life with your own um, your own family members, your own personal relationships with friends and family, children's coworkers, whatever, like how are you seeing that? How have you seen the the power of Christ to heal in moments like that and in situations like that? Um it is it is really very miraculous. Uh definitely check out the footnotes for these. Um yes a little bit of extra things um like he points out that so in in the, the very end of this talk this conference uh, that we're talking about and other nelson's or president nelson's think slash shall talk he announced 20 new temples and one of them uh, is going to be in osaka japan <clears throat> so there'll be three temples um in japan oh sorry this will be the fifth temple in japan so kind of just like extra things to this story, right? And his obviously his uh, his work cited his bibliography of, of where he's getting all these stories. So, um, but yeah, some just some extra history and in context for this story. So definitely check those out. Um, that is all I've got for you guys today. But thank you so much for listening or watching. As um, always, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, um, YouTube, Ch Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, at General Conference Conversations, and I always love to hear from you. So messages and emails, comments, reviews, send them my way. I absolutely love to hear it. So I will talk to you next time.